All right, the first, the first thing we're going to do is go around and take some questions from your tables. <laughs> People felt like they didn't get to ask enough questions last time and we want to be sure that you do get to do that. Do we have Angela and Bob at the ready? Or uh, with questions? Okay, Carol Myers has a question there. This goes back to a comment that Marianne uh, uh, stated. And the fact that we now have uh, teacher quality in the works in Indiana, whose responsibility is it to ensure that parent engagement is a viable part of that um, evaluation? And who's determining what evidence is viable for teacher quality? Um, I think that direction needs to come from the state and so for the question that Dale was asked I, I would like to see that that's a component that is an expectation of the state of Indiana of our Department of Ed that we all that our schools address explicitly address community and, and parental engagement the matrix under the bill the way it's created the um, we have several options they could choose tap or par or they can use a state model, but the um, state model is something that's created by the Department of Education, and then the locals are the ones that decide how they want to implement it. So we leave it at local level, but the state does have a model that um, is supposed to be um, the option if they don't do TAP or PAR, and to get uh, additional funds like um, performance-based pay funds they have to make sure they comply with that so it would be something the Department of Education would have to have in their model to make sure that it uh, falls down to the local level right we're currently in the process of piloting uh, the state model uh, in uh, six school districts across the state and actually if you want to learn more there's a website it's really easy because the the pilot itself is called RISE R-I-S-E doesn't stand for anything but if you just type in www.riseindiana.org It'll give you all the information. It'll tell you the school districts. It's got the sample tools on there, and you can look it over. It's still in the process of being developed. But again, it's www.riseindiana.org. And that does have uh, specific areas for evaluation around parent engagement and on, on ongoing to engagement You know, it, it, I know the, the tool has, has changed, and it's still continuing to be changed. And to, to Representative Banning's point, uh, the, the goal with the, with the RISE tool is to provide a framework, um, but it's the locals each of the school districts that will decide, you know, all the, you know, a lot of the key components that are in there and how they're weighted and so forth. Um, our hope, though, is that certainly local school districts, as they, you know, get together to discuss how to improve their evaluation systems, um, that they'll be very thoughtful in terms of making that a, a, an important component. What are TAP and PAR for those of us who are not educated? Yeah, what are TAP and PAR? I work at UND, but I don't work on that program at all. So I don't know if somebody from UND could talk um, about that a little more. What is yeah. PAR? Would you like to? They are um, teacher appraisal system frameworks, essentially, that um, it, as, as templates over a district, they, they uh, need to be customized to a particular school district. And I should mention that there's another model that has been accepted by the DOE from the Evanston, right. uh, Illinois, as uh, appropriate. And that really is a grassroots uh, effort in a particular local school district to get together all the key players and really look at what would be some ways to raise the bar for everyone in that school. So there's the, the, the template models um, must be customized right. um, at the local level. But that's all they are. Do they have family and community engagement components? If they you put should. it in there. They, they could. Should. They're not they mandated. Could. Again, it is, it is the local district. That's okay. why I'm still going to push on this. I think that guidance needs to be very explicit and come from the people because it won't happen accidentally. It is part of the teacher and principal training. It is not going to be part of plans. And currently in the REPA standards, we're calling for a revision of the REPA standards, Dale, this as a, as a Currently in the REPA standards, the only set of standards that has family and community engagement as part of it are the special ed standards that Abby and I worked on. So until it's part of teacher preparation, principal preparation, they won't see it as an important part of the things. 
But I will say that there are there are school districts. And the evaluation system also needs to have that as part of the formula. Families need to have a voice in saying my school is an A, a B, a C, a D, or an F. But see, and here's here's where, and that's a good point about teacher training. Uh, this is happening already in some, there are collaborations going on in the state between school districts, community organizations, and their, their universities in their, in their communities. Um, I know at IU Southeast, for example, this is happening in the School of Education. The, the, not only are the students that are going through the program receiving uh, specific practicum experiences, a part of that built in is working with the community, working with parents, um, and, and that parental engagement piece. But the faculty has also been trained through a, a program, so they are now implementing this process into their syllabi as well. So I don't think we need to necessarily wait for, for policy to be crafted. This is one of those standpoints or uh, positions where that, that can happen, and it doesn't necessarily have to, it, it should perhaps, and this is a discussion that should happen, but that can happen right now if communities uh, choose to create those types of collaborations, and it's already happening in some places, and I would encourage it to happen everywhere. So one question would be, what are the vehicles that communities are using to make these choices? Well, I think right now what's, what's happened is that you've got a community, in one particular instance, you've got a community organization that has, that sort of grew and blossomed out of uh, the Department of Education down there. And part of the collaboration was, hey, we need to pull in community organizations, local organizations, parent groups, uh, you know, students that are, uh, that are, have, have been hit hardest by that achievement gap, and let's pull these families in and create a model that can then be disseminated throughout the state. And they've done it, and other places have done it as well. Good. No question up here. It's my observation that most of this discussion is, is sort of bipolar. It's the, it's the educational institution versus parents, which is a clearly a strong uh, requirement. But then once in a while I hear the word community and it, there doesn't seem to be much definition of that. As an example, what, what role uh, do employers and other social organizations, uh, the, uh, whether it's a faith-based organization or some other cultural entity, uh, chambers of commerce, what role do they play as, as parts of the community in making this happen? Uh, and, and whose responsibility is it to make sure that they're drawn in and involved in it. And I look at as an example of what's going on with the school system now. The state's taking over some schools here in Marion County, I think, uh, and some others maybe perhaps because of failure. But is there any, any requirements in this remodeling uh, that the larger community be engaged in, a, in an accountable way, um, that a measurable way uh, that contributes to the overall success? They have a vested interest, certainly, because uh, we're creating a workforce. We're creating better citizens. We're creating people who will be productive in the community. But what role do they play in this, in, in, in this equation? That's a great question. And I know one of our, I'll throw that to you in a minute, but one of our panelists who will be on the panel this afternoon, Kathy Gray, is from Evansville Vanderburg. And they have a superlative community engagement and you know, community schools program that I think would provide a terrific model. And in fact, it's one of the programs that's profiled in that report that I've been holding up every so often. Uh, let me toss it to you, Lucinda, and then Bob. Uh, you raise an excellent question, and I think it's something that family or faith-based and community-based organizations are stepping up. Uh, businesses are stepping up. We have great examples all over the state where um, faith-based organizations or companies have partnered with schools. Um, I think the challenge is in this very rapidly changing environment, it's hard for community-based and faith-based organizations to maintain um, those relationships because the, the landscape is changing. And let me just give you a couple examples, just very specifically. Um, when school calendars change, after school providers have to adapt their entire staffing pattern to this new school calendar. And their entire budget has to be wrapped around that particular um, programmatic element. So while the, the Boys and Girls Clubs and all the various um, after school providers are ready and willing to partner, but if they've developed a whole budget um, based on a particular program and school calendar model, it's very challenging for them to remain engaged if the school t calendar changes. And we've got all kinds of examples like that around the state where 
community-based, faith-based, and, and businesses have tried to um, remain engaged, but the rapidly changing environment is making it more difficult. When we've got transportation challenges in the new school choice environment, uh, we've got, for example, um, schools taking school choice vouchers from families that they perhaps didn't have experience supporting in the past. You know, some of the social, um, social and mental health needs, for example, um, that some of the new kids that are coming into those schools, schools aren't equipped. And how do they partner with those other community-based organizations? And I can tell you from a United Way perspective, you know, often communities look to the philanthropic sector to make up the difference and the financial challenges right now are such that we can't just make up the entire difference. So we have to make those authentic partnerships. We heard that word used earlier today um, and just have to keep at it. Thank you. Bob? Yeah, if I can. I know that there's many school corporations out there currently already using the community. I know MSD of Wayne Township that I represent has a mentor program. They've worked in their community for some years. But there is an example of uh, several years ago, Florida went to a accountability system where they decide to add letter grades to student uh, to the school performance as opposed to a nomenclature and you know I think Indiana moving that direction well what they found when they did that is all of a sudden that they had much more community interest because they realized exactly where their schools were and how they were performing before they had no idea and I'll give you an anecdotal experience to that uh, right now, we call a C school in uh, the nomenclature is academic progress, is what it says. I represent Hendricks County, which is the second most affluent county state, second most uh, uh, fastest growing. And uh, the part of Hendricks County I represent is Plainfield. And all of a sudden, I had a number of constituents calling me because, uh, because they didn't make AYP for two consecutive years, they had uh, the highest grade that any of their high schools could get was a letter, a C. And all of a sudden, I've got uh, constituents and community uh, people uh, interested and I even gave a discussion at the local Guilford Township Civic Association last Tuesday I talked about our state uh, accountability model and tried to share with them where they are why they're there and how they can uh, help and change that so I think that when people start to realize exactly what their letter grades are and where they are. I mean, it's, it's, sometimes you're going to say it's, it's a negative, but the other thing is it's an opportunity for service. Another example I had is um, MSD of Perry Township came to um, myself as well, and, and they got a letter grade of D, and they were very concerned about that because they just had a uh, referendum, and they sold the community that they were a high-performing school corporation, and they wanted to know what they could do to make a difference because they've got people coming to them that are concerned about making sure that the kids in their school have um, a high-quality school. So it's, it's actually incentivized more people to get involved in it, and that's the example that happened in Florida as well. It's so another way of creating transparency is to use common standards like that, nomenclature. No. I, I yeah. have a question that I'd like to pose to the panel in regard to early childhood education. If we're truly going to empower families and have families engaged in school and have the community engaged in schools, how would you address this at the early ages? Because uh, in our state, I see that we have more of a deficit model than a positive model for this, including um, mandatory kindergarten, but even below that, preschool and preschool monies available for children in our state. So if you would address that, please. Who would like to take that one on? I'll start. Lucinda? Okay, I'll Lucinda start will start. I Representative Boehning will add. Um, we, we believe that there are uh, both revenue neutral options, just simple policy changes like directing um, CCDF dollars to higher quality care. What's CCDF? Child Care Development Fund. It's a federal fund that brings in about $170 million into Indiana. And um, those dollars are not necessarily tied to quality right now. And we, we believe we would advocate from a United Way perspective to, to make sure that those are tied to quality. Um, another non-revenue uh, neutral option would be to really start creating the culture that early education is important. And it involves, you know, not when you're seven years old, but really starting at birth and starting those conversations with parents. Because an engaged parent at age 
at six months, two years, three years, is going to be an engaged, a more engaged parent at six or seven when they enter school. Um, then there are, of course, some revenue uh, requiring options like preschool, like fully funded full day kindergarten. Um, and we, we believe that those would be very important to making sure the kids can read by third grade. And we know that they're not the silver bullet. They're not the only thing because we still need active parent engagement. We still need all the wraparound programs. And like a lot of the panelists have mentioned before, our safety net programs, because of budget constraints, because of where the economy is, um, lots of stresses are on our families right now. And um, when you push those other things, you know, that stress comes out in the education environment. So there's no silver bullet, but we certainly believe a cultural change, some revenue neutral policy changes, and um, then really to have an honest conversation about some of the revenue requiring changes like pre-K and full day kindergarten. Thank you. Um, I, Lucinda and I were talking at the break about CCDF funds, and I uh, actually am trying to, I've been working with the governor's office to try to figure out how we can um, better maximize the opportunity we have with those to create an ed educational uh, appropriate opportunity for kids using those funds and uh, it is something that I think you'll see we um, I hopefully will have some legislation coming out this next session dealing with that uh, we had an interim study committee go to one of the ministries um, that was um, uh, child care providers and they had two adult supervisors to 56 children they had one restroom facility for a uh, school of 56 and they have 13 facilities in Marion County and uh, we're going to have to somehow address the issue without trying to split the baby and say uh, ministries do this and somebody else do that and try to improve quality and age appropriate learning for those child care services so 170 million dollars the goal would be to maximize that investment and provide as uh, like I said age appropriate learning opportunities for those kids as we um, that take advantage of those dollars so hopefully it's going to take collaboration from many but hopefully we'll be able to try to address that issue thank you Bob we have time for one more question then it's lunch all right um, when is it on okay when legislation is being created what process do you go through to look at unintended consequences and the supports that are needed and also to make sure that whatever is created we were talking about needs to be research based and it just seems like so many times those three critical components it doesn't seem like they're factored into legislation that we see Mary Ann I would agree. you as a legislator <laughs> yes I agree I, I think that um, we don't pay adequate attention to unintended consequences of the policies that we get through. Sometimes um, there is an urgency that pushes things through before they're quite ready, and we are able to make mid-course corrections and respond to that, and sometimes bad things happen and we respond to that, and I think it's kind of the nature of public policy and a part-time legislature when um, but I do think that legislators look at the best recommendations, and they do pay attention to research. But there's also kind of a battling uh, research environment out there, and depends who did the study. And so, you know, um, my background's in policy analysis, and I find it very challenging to kind of wade through all of the conflicting information that's out there on these programs. So, you know, you spend full time kind of focusing on these issues, and so you're, you're very well versed, and we're spending time on a lot of issues that we would love to be <laughs> very well versed in as well. But um, I do think with the teacher evaluation, um, we, we need to think through if, you know, we have this kind of um, different way of looking at teaching that, that we're not just going to be punitive, that we are going to provide opportunities for people to improve their practice, and that's going to have to come somehow with resources, with support, and, uh, you know, we didn't quite get there. But I think we will get there because I think it's the right thing to do. Thank you. That was well said. So it's lunchtime, and... What we'll do is have lunch and reconvene about 1240. <laughs>